Hi everyone, before we begin I'd like to take a moment to talk about the sponsor of this video, Brilliant.org. I take courses there myself, I'm currently brushing up on my vector calculus. The courses are brilliant, pun definitely intended, and they include interactive exercises that award you XP if you get them right. It's a cheap psychological trick that absolutely works and it actually makes you learn. It's much better than just watching video lectures. Why would you want to learn? Well, that's up to you. Maybe you have goals you want to reach in your professional life. Maybe you want to avoid sounding like an idiot online. Or maybe you're just like me and that you simply love learning stuff. If you think vector calculus sounds like it's too advanced for you, don't worry. There are thousands of lessons available with more being added monthly. The courses go all the way from beginner, like everyday mathematics, too advanced, like vector calculus and group theory. You'll also find courses in areas like computer science and physics. Sign up with the link below today, brilliant.org slash martimer81, and get started on your free 30-day trial period today. The first 200 to sign up using this link will also get a 20% discount on their annual fee. Thank you. Here comes the video. Hi, everyone. So I've said it before and I'll say it again. If you don't know what this means, don't ever talk about quantum mechanics. It's introductory quantum mechanics, often lecture one. The reason a lot of you are looking at this going, what? Is that introductory quantum mechanics is not an introductory course in physics. It requires that you've already taken calculus, both single and multivariable, as well as vector calculus and complex calculus, linear algebra, statistics, classical mechanics, electromagnetic theory, thermodynamics, wave theory. I think that's about it. The, the point is, it's an advanced topic, and most people don't know anything about it, and thus should not talk about it. They'll just end up sounding like idiots. So, Jordan! No one understands consciousness, what it is, or how it works. Given how poorly that term is defined, I tend to agree. I'm not even sure there's anything to understand. But I'm sure we'll get back to that. And no one understands quantum mechanics, what it is or how it works. Wrong. I know Richard Feynman said so, but what he meant was that it can't be understood using concepts we're familiar with from everyday life. But there are different ways to understand things, and there are degrees of understanding. We understand quantum mechanics through mathematics. And we understand it well enough to produce technology based on it that wouldn't work if we had no understanding of it. We actually understand it very well. Coincidence? I think not! Last time we touched on the subject, we discussed how ideas like quantum mysticism and consciousness generally have been met with skepticism and disapproval because of their common association with... Woo. In science, everything is met with skepticism. That's because we don't want bad ideas that don't survive scrutiny to be accepted. Turns out quantum mysticism is a bad idea. If anyone watching this is somehow unfamiliar with the difference between quantum mechanics and quantum mysticism, here's a quick summary. One is, slightly simplified, the study of physics at the subatomic scales, which answers questions such as, what is the probability of finding this subatomic system in this particular state? The other is a pseudoscience that uses terminology that, at least to layman, sounds like it's from quantum mechanics, but makes claims about spirituality and metaphysics, and tries to justify supernatural mind-over-matter type nonsense by referencing quantum mechanics, as if quantum means psychic or magic, and as if quantum mechanics had made methodological naturalism or physicalism obsolete. Laymen are at risk of falling for this, because they don't know what quantum mechanics is, so when someone references it, they just assume the reason it all seems like magic is that it's legitimate science that's way above their heads. No one who has seriously studied quantum mechanics believes in quantum mysticism, because we know that quantum mechanics has nothing to do with anything mystical, spiritual, supernatural, or esoteric. The so-called hard problem of consciousness was coined by David Chalmers in 1995. He said that the most puzzling question in the scientific approach to consciousness is how our conscious minds can experience unique sensations like colors, tastes, and sounds. I think that's a bad question in that it assumes that there is a significant difference between information processing and the perception of information processing. 
The answer, there is no difference. The perception of information processing is just more information processing, is rejected on the grounds that it leads right back to the same question. How can we experience perception of that? Which of course leads right back to the same answer. It's not a satisfying answer to some people because they seem to have a desire for consciousness to be more than an emergent property of a sufficiently complex system that processes information. They want there to be a soul. They just don't want to use that word because it sounds ridiculous. It's just like how religious people don't want to use the word magic when they talk about what God can do. The real hard problem, in my opinion, is that consciousness is poorly defined. It appears to be impossible to find a definition that makes it be consistent with what people intuitively understand it to mean and also be objectively measurable. Without such a definition, it appears that we are talking about a subjective experience, and then there's really nothing to study scientifically. Sensations like this are called qualia, which are defined as individual instances of subjective conscious experience. And there you go. It's subjective. In fact, almost every line of thought on the relationship of consciousness to physics runs into deep trouble. So much so that any notion of consciousness in the mind is often relegated to the realm of metaphysics or philosophy or, you know, spiritual mumbo jumbo. Right, because you can't objectively measure subjective experience. You could measure neural activity or observe behavior that correlates with verbal reports of conscious experience, but you can't measure the actual subjective experience because it's subjective. It's because we see through our eyes that we often take for granted that our viewpoint of the world is in our heads. But there's a simple yet mysterious question here. If we are consciousness within or existing through a body, where in the body are we? Where is our awareness actually located? In the brain, jackass. But if you want something more specific, a better answer might be that it's a bad question. Because awareness isn't a thing that occupies a specific location. It's an activity. It's what the brain does. It's like going to a football game and asking where the game is and demanding a more precise answer than on the field. The game is not an object that has a location the way the ball or a player does. It's an activity. In theory, if the brain was exclusively made of neurons and physical material, then we should be able to recreate or model its processes in an AI and have it work exactly like a normal brain, right? Yes, in principle, or some equivalent thereof. I really don't see why that wouldn't be the case. But it isn't complete. There's a missing piece in the AI puzzle. It can't make informed decisions or apply meaning to data. We can observe an AI's behavior and conclude that it does not appear to be conscious. No currently existing AI does, at least not as we think of the term conscious. But there's no reason to believe that a much more complex AI couldn't be. Couldn't be. Also, keep in mind that we don't design AIs to be conscious. We design them to perform specific tasks. While they may be aware of their environment, you know, they're able to take in information and process it, there's no reason for them to develop a sense of self. We do because it's related to our survival instinct. We have evolved to survive. An AI has been designed to perform a specific task. This has led some scientists to invoke quantum physics to explain the missing piece. But it doesn't. Most of us are probably familiar with the double slit experiment and even the misconception that consciousness causes the wave collapse. Right, that is a misconception. Jordan got something right. And whenever Jordan gets something right, within five seconds he will say something so stupid it more than cancels it out. So face palm in five, four. Thing is, in the 70s, physicists came up with another experiment called the Delayed, delayed choice, choice Quantum, quantum eraser. eraser. It uses some crazy engineering to make measurements on the paths of photons, light particles, but only after they should have chosen whether to take one path or a superposition of multiple. You'd think we could catch mother nature out here, but no. It turns out that just as Neil Bohr predicted, it makes no difference whether we delay the measurement or not. 
As long as we measure the photon's path before its arrival at a detector, we still lose the interference pattern. Jordan, stop. As usual, you have absolutely no idea what you're talking about. Your image doesn't even have the signal photon in it. That's not a trivial error because it completely ruins the experiment, which you clearly don't understand. A photon is sent through a double slit. It'll go through slit A, slit B, or both. Immediately after passing the double slit, the photon is split into two entangled photons of half the original photon's frequency. One, the signal photon, hits detector D0, no matter which slit it passed through. The other, the idler photon, hits a prism and continues on different paths through beam splitters depending on which slit it went through. Detectors D1 and D2 can be hit by photons from either slit, but D3 and D4 can only be reached by photons from A and B respectively. If the which path information can be seen, in other words if D3 or D4 record a hit, then D0 will show a diffraction pattern, as if it only went through one slit. If D1 or D2 is hit, D0 shows an interference pattern, meaning the original photon went through both slits. What's funny is that D0 is the first detector to be hit. This leads to the interpretation that the signal photon is somehow affected by what happens to the idler photon in the future. Retrocausality. This would have huge consequences as it violates relativity. According to relativity, no information can propagate faster than the speed of light, which it obviously does if it arrives before it's even sent out. The problem with this interpretation, however, is that if there is a causal relationship here, it could easily be reversed. It's the signal photon that determines the path of the idler photon. The first photon to hit a detector determines what happens to the other. Another interpretation is that there is no causal relationship at all between the photons. For example, in the many worlds interpretation, the probability of finding oneself looking back at a contradictory outcome, such as D1 registering a hit and D0 showing a diffraction pattern, is zero as it violates the laws of quantum mechanics we use to calculate the probability in the first place. As such, we must find ourselves in a universe where the experiment had an outcome that coincidentally looks like the future determines the past. To paraphrase Sherlock Holmes, once we eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, no matter how improbable it may appear, must be the outcome. As a result, the consensus is that this experiment does not show evidence of retrocausality, but it is very interesting nonetheless. It's a wonderful illustration of how quantum mechanics messes with our intuitive understanding of causality. But since you evidently agree that the consciousness causes collapse interpretation is bad, and even the misconception that consciousness causes the wave collapse, how the hell can you think that this experiment has anything to do with consciousness? In other words, it's almost as if the particle knows not only when we're looking at it, but also when we're about to look at it. The delayed choice experiment implies that the sheer act of noticing, rather than any physical disturbance, can cause the collapse. Oh, damn, I took the oven mitt off. That's what led some physicists early on, like Eugene Wigner, to assume that the wave nature of particles was somehow interacting with our own consciousness. Naturally, it was slow to get off the ground, but in recent years, this idea, that there are quantum processes going on in the brain has gained some weight. Not in the relevant parts of the scientific community. What if becoming aware consciously of quantum processes is a spiritual experience? It's easy to say that when you don't know what a quantum process is. Practically speaking, if proof of the spiritual can be found at all, it will likely be found in the quantum field theory. Practically speaking? Practically speaking, you have no idea what quantum field theory is. And to be fair, while today we're talking about the brain, we also know that the heart is a hundred times stronger electrically and a thousand times stronger magnetically than the brain. Even assuming that's true, I can't be bothered to check, the heart is just a pump and it has nothing to do with consciousness. And perhaps embodying that electromagnetic field as an experience is the quote unquote spiritual experience. Well, since the heart's electromagnetic field is always there, we would always be embodying it, so wouldn't that make every experience a spiritual one, thus making the term absolutely meaningless? Back to the brain though. To understand it well, we can relate it with quantum computers today, where points of data can occupy both zero and one together. 
So then with the brain, is this the same process of our ability to hold onto two mutually exclusive ideas at the same time? No, Jordan. Idiots like you can believe mutually exclusive things because you don't understand basic logic. It's not a quantum phenomenon, it's a stupid phenomenon. But let me be clear about this. There's a big difference between being undecided, seeing good things with this and good things with that, and not, you know, sometimes leaning this way and sometimes leaning that way. And actually believing both X and not X. The way you do when you say that the Earth is both flat and round. The Earth is round and flat at the same time. Arguably the most famous person to suggest this quantum mind theory is Roger Penrose, professor of math at Oxford and one of the mentors of Stephen Hawking. Yeah, I figured you'd mention him. While he is a brilliant mathematician who recently shared a Nobel Prize in physics, his ideas regarding this particular topic have not caught on in the relevant parts of the scientific community. He put forth that there are molecular structures in our brains that are able to alter their state in response to a single quantum event, which means that quantum superpositions have something to do with the way neurons are triggered to communicate via electrical signals. Yeah, so? Basically, there are quantum processes responsible for how or where the neurons fire in our brains, which of course affect how we perceive reality. But how does this explain consciousness? Even if he's right, it still doesn't explain anything. Besides, if consciousness is a quantum phenomenon, then it's something physical, not something spiritual, not something magical. Quantum mechanics is not the study of magic, it's the study of physics at very small scales. Now, it's still not 100% though, and there are a couple issues with the idea. Jordan was right again! Scientifically speaking, we can't say that consciousness comes from the quantum world. I mean, who knows? Perhaps consciousness is even beyond the quantum world, informing it from a realm of pure thought that we can't even perceive just yet. Today, Orcor has made a few biological predictions that did turn out to be wrong and isn't an accepted model of brain physiology in mainstream science at the moment. Right, for one, it assumes that the temperature in the brain is absolute zero. See, neurons fire out at milliseconds in the brain, and in order for quantum behavior to be possible there, quantum effects would have to be measured in femtoseconds. That's a trillion times faster than a millisecond. If only you knew what any of that meant, it would have spared us your video. Consider that, like in the many worlds interpretation, every conceivable reality exists at any moment, which means there are multiple realities where the thing that you want to manifest already exists. No, Jordan, not every conceivable reality exists in the many worlds interpretation. Every physically possible reality. There's a big difference considering that you can conceive of things that are not just physically impossible, but even logically impossible, like Jews being from space. Two extraterrestrial races stepped in. The first race were the Hebrews. See, Jordan, the word Hebrew refers to a specific human ethnic group. If they were to come from space, they would not be a human ethnic group, and thus would not be Hebrews. It's not just physically impossible, it's logically impossible. Yes, I managed to get a space Jew reference into this video. I didn't think I was going to be able to do that. The physical mechanistic worldview is the current bedrock on which modern science is founded. But with that comes a pretty big limitation. Yes, as we study observable reality, you know, what science studies, we are limited to studying observable reality. That is a good thing. That's what prevents us from making up bullshit that has nothing to do with observable reality. How can we expect to prove something non-physical if the tools and methods that we use are only suitable for physical work? Just because we have no way of studying something at the moment doesn't mean it doesn't exist and denying it purely on the grounds that we can't study it is wildly unscientific. Okay, for one, everything we experience is physical. That's actually by definition of the word physical, part of the reality we experience. Second, quantum mechanics studies the physical and nothing but the physical. Nothing you have talked about in this video is non-physical. 
finally, no one in science is denying the existence of the non-physical. Science simply can't address it. Because science is the study of that which can be studied empirically. You know, the stuff that we can actually experience. If there were some realm that's currently inaccessible to us, and we learned how to make it accessible, then we would be able to experience it. We would be able to observe it and test it empirically. And then it would have to be reclassified as, you're really going to hate this, physical. See ya.